What's going on, everybody? It's Will, and we're coming back for another episode of the Hunt Stand Podcast. On today's episode, we're going to be bringing on team member Brian Murphy. Now, for those of y'all that may not know Brian, he comes from a very prestigious background working in the whitetail world as the CEO for QDMA, and that's the Quality Deer Management Association. And now, we are super lucky to have him on the Hunt Stand team. And so today, we're going to bring him on to kind of pick his brain a little bit about shed hunting, but we're also going to get to find out a little bit about Brian, kind of what he's done over the past 25, 30 years. But primarily, we're going to be talking how to find shed antlers, where to look, how to kind of strategize a plan to go about finding sheds, doing a little bit of scouting. And then we're also going to kind of learn from Brian how and what you can learn from those sheds there's there's a lot that whenever you pick up that antler what it can tell you about that deer and a little bit about your deer herd so we're gonna be picking his brain a lot on that finding out more about him but you know again guys and girls we just want to thank y'all for tuning in to this episode because there's a lot of other podcasts out there and if y'all don't mind head on over to whatever platform you're listening on whether it's apple spotify waypoint tv app and go on over there and rate and review this episode for us you know and if you've got different questions different topics you want to hear from us and you want to make sure your voice is heard head on over open up your email send us an email at podcast at huntstand.com so that way you know we can get some questions from y'all and podcast about it you know we don't always see everything on social media we try to scour that as much as we can listen to as much as we can but if you definitely want to make sure your voice is heard send us an email but on today's episode we got a lot that we're going to learn from Brian Murphy, and so we hope you all enjoy. All right, we're live, everybody. We're back for another episode of the Hunt Stand Podcast, and today we have a renowned wildlife biologist, Mr. Brian Murphy, also uh, part of the Hunt Stand team on board with us today. So, Brian, thank you for stepping on the podcast with me today. Uh, my pleasure. Always good to talk deer. Oh, it's always fun, man. So, one of the things I like to do to get this podcast started out with and introduce you, the guest, to everybody is I want you to give us a 30 foot tree stand view of who Brian Murphy is. Well, probably like many of your listeners, I grew up as an avid hunter and outdoorsman and uh, dreamed about, you know, uh, working with wildlife as a real job. And I didn't even know that existed uh, <laughs> until I was 12 years old. A uh, true story. I was reading an outdoor life magazine. And I read an article about a wildlife biologist working on deer somewhere, probably the Midwest. And uh, I did what all 12 year olds do. I convened a meeting with my parents and told them that I have I decided what I'm going to be in life. And they looked at me you know, quizzically and I said, I'm going to be a wildlife biologist. I'm going to work on deer. And they looked at me and said, is that a real job? Does it actually pay money? And uh, but thankfully, they they supported me. And, and so I pursued uh, a degree in wildlife biology, uh, did my undergraduate at Texas Tech University. OK had the good good fortune then to kind of be at the front end of the quality deer management movement which originated in texas mm -hmm. and so i got an early indoctrination to to that philosophy got to meet the famous al brothers while there and work on a number of deer projects throughout texas and the hill country south texas uh doing mature buck home range studies uh, helicopter deer capture work i mean just really a lot of fun stuff that any deer enthusiast would enjoy and and that opened up the door for me to get um uh, get into the University of Georgia for my graduate research, which uh, you know, at the time and still is one of the most renowned deer research uh, universities around and got a chance to study under uh, Dr. Larry Marchington and Dr. Carl Miller, two of the noted uh, scientists of the time. And that opened up a tremendous number of doors for me. Uh, in fact, I didn't even finish graduating at University of Georgia before they hired me on uh, as a deer research coordinator for wow. the University of Georgia. So I got to spend some time just waking up every day, wanting, you know, determining what we wanted to learn about whitetail deer and uh, getting graduate students. And so we did scent communication work, vision research, just a whole host of uh, behavior and biology topics on deer. And that was just a, an inc incredible opportunity for me. And then had something even more unique surface. And that was a, a chance to be the first deer biologist in Australia. And uh, so I packed my bags and my wife and I went down under for four years. And uh, wow was based in uh, in the little island of Tasmania, Australia. Um, I got a chance to work with uh, fallow deer there. And then I, I got uh, 
got to work on the mainland of Australia on their other five species of deer they have. So they have six species there. And uh, so I set up a quality deer management program for them there and uh, came back after four years down under and speaking a little funny, by the way. Uh, and my, my friends would look at me and say, you look the same, but boy, you sound different. Uh, <laughs> it, it took about a year to lose the accent. But anyway, so I uh, came back and was uh, offered the opportunity to uh, to run the fledgling quality deer management association, which was very small at the time. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so I took that over and actually moved it into my upstairs bedroom in a rental house. I was a staff of one. Uh, and uh, we started to, to build the, the quality deer management uh, association uh, around the movement that was starting around North America at the time. And uh, I was so blessed to spend 23 years, nearly an entire career running that great organization and uh, really seeing the monumental change that took place across North America yeah. in, in whitetail management. Uh, hunters today know so much more about deer biology and deer management than ever before. Things mm-hmm. we take for granted now weren't taken for granted 25 years ago. Uh, so I think it's important for hunters to understand that we have come a long way. Uh, we've got new challenges today, but so uh, we had a, a great run there. And then um, um, I left QDMA in March of 2020, just as COVID was hitting. And I uh, joined, not long after that, joined the Hunt Stand team. And uh, I knew Lanford Holloway, our CEO, very well, uh, having worked with him at QDMA for a number of years and watching Hunt Stand grow and make a difference. And so when he reached out to me and said, hey, we need a, a whitetail partnership guy. And uh, by the way, we, we could also use a biologist. I said, well, I, I know a guy that might fit that bill. And uh, so I, I jumped in with both feet and uh, a year and a half later, we're here. And, and frankly, I'm having so much fun. I can't stand it. It's been a great, great run. Heck yeah, man. It sounds like definitely a, a great, uh, great track record, man. That's awesome. So I want to I want to back up a little bit to 12 year old Brian. Mm-hmm. You know, you you made that decision back then that you wanted to do this. This is what you wanted to make a career. What led you to that? Like what? I mean, I'm assuming your dad probably intro- your dad, uncles, somebody probably introduced you to deer hunting. Is that what happened or? Well, believe, believe it or not, uh, it was a little a little a little different than the norm. Uh, my dad was an avid shooter. OK, uh, he, he grew up hunting some very occasionally with my grandfather, who was an incredibly passionate mm-hmm. deer hunter and fly fisherman in New Mexico. So mostly, uh, you know, elk, mule deer and pronghorn were his his table fare of the day. Uh, my father was, uh, like I said, an, an occasional hunter. In fact, I've only hunted one day in my entire life with my father. OK, uh, so so I don't have a long history of learning it from him. But we did grow up in, in rural Oklahoma uh, out in the country. And uh, he, you know, being a gun advocate, he was certainly willing to let me pursue my passion of hunting. So I was self-taught. Uh, he handed me an air rifle as a young child and got my first 22 at eight and uh, just roamed the hills of northeast Oklahoma looking for anything that a young redneck kid could find to shoot at. <laughs> and uh, then I learned to trap. I uh, had a good mentor in trapping. And so I, and, and it was, in fact, uh, deer were very rare at that time in that part of the state. Okay. And, and I remember vividly uh, my nearest neighbor as a young child was a mile down the road and he had a great fishing pond and I'd pedal my bike down and fish with him. And I was pedaling down the dirt road one day and I found what I thought was a deer track. And uh, I remember it vividly. And so I pedaled back home with the most excitement, like Christmas had just arrived early and uh, grabbed my father and said, I think I found a deer track. And he said, son, you probably, it's probably somebody's cow or their goat or whatever. But he, he humored me and took me down in his truck and we looked at it and he goes, son, you found a deer track. <laughs> And uh, I'm like, holy, holy smokes, we actually have deer out here, you know. And yeah. it wasn't that long after that that I was out roaming with my 22 and uh, looking for rabbits and came face to face with a doe on a trail. And I was probably 11 at the time. And it just changed my whole perspective of these these ghosts that um, I wanted to know all I can about them because they were so rare. Mm-hmm. It's hard for today's hunters to understand how rare deer were in some parts of our country back in, in the 70s. Um, but uh, and it wasn't long after that that uh, that um, they opened a, a short season, and um, I had a friend of mine, Native American kid, and his father were you know they professed to be deer hunters. They knew far less than the average person knows today, but but yeah. they were deer hunters, and so I got to to accompany them uh, as an eleven year old and a twelve year old while deer hunting. Um, now I did not see a deer uh, while hunting, uh, but that was not uncommon. Our expectations mm-hmm. were not very high. Um, and, and I think on the second year of that, um, one of our parties shot a small year and a half old buck and 
And I was so excited because I got to bring home, we shared the venison and you share a spike buck, you know, four ways, five ways. It doesn't mean much. I got a Ziploc bag or probably back then a bread sack, yeah, a bread sack full of venison, but I brought home meat. And uh, so I was just enamored as a young child with these, these creatures that I read about in magazines, but we just didn't have uh, around at any note. Uh, and so I dedicated my life at that point to learning everything I possibly could about whitetail deer. And I've been so fortunate to, have a career that's allowed me to do that. And I'm um, still learning. I still want to learn every day, uh, both as a hunter and a biologist. And, uh, you know, many of the iconic deer experts of the last 50 years, I count them all as friends, uh, which is an incredible honor uh, because I've learned so much from them. So uh, it's, it's a path, whether you're a hunter or a researcher, it's the same path. We're still learning all we can every day and trying to pick up new insights because they're incredibly complex animals. And, uh, you know, anybody that thinks they've got them figured out is mistaken because they're, they're as unique as we are. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and despite all the trail cameras and other advanced tactics we have today, uh, it's still not an easy animal to, uh, to, to harvest consistently, particularly if you're after that, that small percentage of mature wise bucks in a population. Oh, man, ain't that the truth? Every time I think I have the deer figured out where we get to hunt, nope, they, they, they flip it on me. They flip the script. So, yeah, they're... Yeah. I love it, man. Well, I want to take this time of sitting down with you in the podcast for the time of year it is. There's a lot of people where, you know, past month or so, they've just been snowed in, snow starting to melt now. We're starting to get into March, April time frame, And so people are starting to get deer hunting back on their mind. They want to get out on their property. They want to figure out what to do next year. But I want to really focus on shed antlers you know you, you recently did a brian or a murphy's law piece on this for hunt stand content and i want to talk about that you know from finding sheds how do you find them how do you um, work on locating them from an e-scouting perspective what do those sheds tell you and how does it help you plan for the next year so i guess first and foremost you know how are you finding sheds are you just going out looking for them or do you know certain parts of property where you're going to go find these antlers? Well, I think before we address, address kind of where to find them, it may be worth just stepping back a little bit and talking mm -hmm. about the antler casting process, what we know about when bucks cast, how that varies between northern environments and southern environments, uh, what can cause early casting or delayed uh, holding of the antlers. There's a lot of sort of fascinating information there that all relate to how, where, and when you find shed antlers. Yeah. So, so, so obviously, you know, many hunters probably are aware that what actually causes bucks to shed their antlers or to cast their antlers, as we call it, uh, is actually the reverse of the process that causes them to harden their antlers and shed their velvet back in the autumn. So what causes that is a, a, a sharp spike in the, in the hormone testosterone, and that causes that final mineralization of the antler. In other words, turning it from that soft velvet-covered bony matrix into a true hard antler. Um, and so that's what happens in the fall. Uh, testosterone levels stay high during the breeding season in these bucks as they're chasing does and looking for receptive does. And then what happens as we enter the late winter, early spring period, particularly after the winter uh, equinox occurs, is we start getting increased day length again. And that increased day length triggers a response in the deer's eyes, kind of a reversal response right. to its optic nerve. And that optic nerve then sig sends signals to through the brain down to the reproductive organs and says, Hey guys, it's time for testosterone levels to drop. And when they drop to a sufficient level, the antlers fall off. Okay. So, so that's kind of what's happening. Now we know from, from research that there, there is a general difference and this is general at best, but in, in general deer in Northern environments, say from the Mason Dixon line North, they all pretty much have a traditional November rut. Uh, they also uh, have cold, you know, cold winters. Uh, we see older bucks typically rutting hard and fast and then casting their antlers first and younger bucks actually holding their antlers a little bit longer in the south where we have highly variable ruts in fact there's there's you know it's it's uh you know early february now and there's still a rut going on yeah in the deep south so we those bucks obviously need to retain their te high testosterone levels in their headgear so we typically see older bucks retaining their antlers longer uh, than, than the younger bucks in the South where they have to maintain those high testosterone levels and breed those does. Mm -hmm. Now we also know that, that any, any degree of abnormal stress to the deer, whether that's physical stress, uh, 
thermal stress, disease, injury, anything that really causes some disruption in a deer's normal daily you know, work, if you will, causes early casting or can cause it. So, you know, in fact, I just came back this past weekend from a late season hunt, a February hunt in South Texas. Uh, they have a deer management assistance program that allows certain landowners to, to continue hunting. And, and their ruts typically around Christmas there. Yeah. Uh, and so it's, you would expect the bucks to still be in hard antler. And yet we had this abnormally uh, harsh cold front come through right before we got there, drop down into the twenties with wind chills in the teens, which when you think of South Texas, you're on the same parallel, almost with Miami, Florida, and you're far South. And so those deer are not used to seeing temperatures that cold. And, uh, what we observed was probably a third to a half of all the mature bucks had already cast their antlers on this particular property, really? which is, which is abnormal. So we had to be real careful not to shoot one of those bucks as a doe. Mm-hmm. Um, so that, that's, uh, that's, I, I assume that, uh, that that's what caused it because this ranch has good nutrition. So, you know, nutritional stress can cause it, uh, injury disease and other things can cause early casting and up in the big woods areas of the Northeast, uh, many of those those systems are are mast driven system, uh, acorn driven systems, and so if you have a, an acorn mast failure, nutrition can be down across the board, and we can see early casting in in those areas too. Okay, well, that's some of the what we know about antler casting. Now, in terms of time, uh, individual casting dates for bucks, we don't have a lot of good data in the wild, but in captive environments, deer research facilities, etc. Most of those bucks cast within a couple of days of the same time each year. Uh, whether the early casting dates are a little bit later than the rest of their group, they typically have a unique casting pattern. Mm-hmm. Now, what is a little bit confusing there is that those deer are on constant high quality nutrition. We don't have, we have a lot more, you know, variables in the environment. So I don't know, I can't say with any degree of certainty that that's occurring in, in wild deer. So okay. we just don't have the data. Now, the other thing we know, uh, again, from, from captive deer is that most bucks will cast both antlers within a 48 hour period generally. So we don't typically see one buck, you know, run around with one antler for a week lot later than its other one, unless it maybe just literally bumped it on something. The one that came off early, sometimes if they bump into something that may cause that one to come off a little bit prematurely. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's kind of what we know about the casting process uh, in terms of where to look for them um, and how to look for them. I mean, obviously I, I start with, areas that deer are feeding late season, you know, food plots are an ideal situation. Uh, if you don't have food plots, any other ag sources, or if you have some native vegetation areas that deer typically congregate in during the, the late winter period, you're more likely to find them there. Um, obviously uh, you also want to connect the bedding areas where they typically bed to the feeding areas, because somewhere in that path is likely where those antlers are going to be, whether they're the antlers are in their beds or on their travel corridors to and from feed areas. Because typically the late winter um, home range of a buck shrinks. Once the rut's over, they're not expanding that home range looking for does. So they're going to concentrate their their home range typically around a, a food source. And so they're going to be in a concentrated area of your property. Um, you know, I like to look at areas where deer have to navigate fences. Uh, if you have feeders, things where they can either the jolt of them jumping or the bumping their heads on something, you know, would cause the antlers to come off. So I, I do concentrate on those areas. Now, beyond that, uh, what I what I, I, I like to do is use the hunt stand app, and I use it all the time for cast antler hunting, is I'll take a block of woods and I'll systematically work that block of woods. Yeah. A, lot of hunters, a lot of hunters say, oh, I'm already doing that. What, how's the app going to help me do that? Well, I can tell you, uh, and I use the, the app's trace path function, where it actually puts a, a dotted line on the ground where you've walked on the map. Mm-hmm. And, and I can tell you, Unless you have completely flat open hardwoods, it's hard harder than one would think to walk a perfectly straight line and not miss areas. Oh yeah, um, you know, trust me, I've I've done it and I've done it in areas where I thought I was I didn't even need the app, and I look back and I've missed blocks of the woods that I thought I'd walk through and I clearly hadn't. Yeah, because you have to circumnavigate, you know, thickets, down trees, whatever it is, and so you correct your path and the topography of the land doesn't run perfectly north and south or east and west typically, so you your your body naturally flows in, a, in an area that isn't in a straight functional line often. Mm-hmm. And so I'll systematically work a block of woods um, and, and then check it on the, on the app. And if I find an antler, I'll often drop a mark just as a reminder of me where I found it. So that may help me find something, particularly if I want to find a, a, a set, set of sheds, a match set, I might want to go back in and spend some more time looking for that one. 
So I used the trace path function and, uh, and, and worked the area. And of course I used trail camera data, observation data to know when most, if not all the bucks have cast, because obviously if you start shed hunting a little too early, you may have to go back and walk some of that same ground again uh, later. So I, I, I'm a little bit lazy. So I typically wait till they're pretty much all on the ground. I don't have other shed hunters on my property. Yeah. Yeah. And I try to get out, you know, as quick after all of them hit the ground as I can because the spring green up hadn't happened yet. So February, early March, turkey right before turkey season or during turkey season is often a good time. Gotcha. So I kind of want to back up just a minute talking about um, when they cast. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, you talked about, you know, the different equinox basically triggers that um, sensor, if you would, in their eye that tells them to fall off. Do you have you seen before that either a warmer or colder winter will affect how soon those antlers drop? Absolutely. As as a as a reference, to any amount of stress on a deer can cause early casting, and and that's what I think we saw in South mm-hmm. Texas because they got an abnormal cold front through there right before we arrived. So I suspect it caused you know uh, premature casting by a couple of weeks in that particular area above when it would normally have occurred. And, and that's, that's not uncommon. So yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I don't see warm weather necessarily extending that. Um, okay. It's really a daylight driven thing, short of a stress. Now, obviously if we had a incredible heat wave during the peak of winter, it might cause something like that, but I don't think there's enough heat that's going to cause that stress that a cold front can, can do those bitterly cold temperatures, I think are really the culprit here. Um, so, so when I find a cast antler too, that, you know, a lot of people pick it up and go, oh, nice deer, whatever. And they don't think much more about what it can tell them. And yeah. There's, there's really a, a tremendous amount of data that you can get um, that helps you as a hunter and a deer manager. And so the first thing I, I do, like any hunters, I pick it up and admire it. And, and it's, to me, it reminds me of my, my youth when I used to look for airheads back in Oklahoma. You know, each one is this unique little story. Mm-hmm. And, and, and let's face it, you know, most hunters are running trail cams now and they know most of the bucks that use their properties on a regular basis anyway. And so, you know, my first thought is, all right, which buck is this? And uh, do I know him? And generally I do, or at least I can find him in, in the trail cam pictures eventually. So, so I go back and I look at the trail cams and I, I try to assign a rough age to that animal. Uh, using the primarily the trail cam pictures to look at body characteristics. I probably already have a rough age on him anyway, so I've probably done that during the season. Right. So I, I try to group all the antlers uh, in rough age groups, and at least I can separate with some degree of certainty the one-year-olds, the two-year-olds, and the threes, three to fours, and the five pluses. You know, you, you don't have to be perfect. Mm-hmm. What it does is it starts to give you a, a, an idea of what age classes to expect the following hunting season. So it gives you a barometer of kind of the group of bucks you're carrying over. Obviously, all of them will be a year older next year. So you can kind of say, all right, if we have this many one and a halfs, some won't make it, but most will, hopefully. And so we'll have this roughly this many two-year-olds, three-year-olds, four pluses. The next thing I do is I, if it's a buck that was in the, the shooter cali- caliber yeah. range, we were thinking about harvesting, or just a nice young buck that we thought, man, that buck scores great for a two-year-old or whatever, is I'll go back and I'll run the tape over it. And obviously assign a, a rough Boone and Crockett or a spread to it to get a rough Boone and Crockett score. And then I'll go back to my trail cam pictures and say, what did I guess that buck at? You know, what, what, you know, if I guessed it at 120 and it scored 130, then I'm being a little conservative and vice versa if I overestimated it. So I, I like to kind of use that to fine tune my, my scoring ability so that I get a little bit better each, each season. Uh, Next thing I'll do is is I'll I'll look at the 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 the, the burr or the, the cast part of the antler yeah. and look for any portions of, of 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 extra material from the pedicle. The pedicle is just the stump from which the antler grows. But often, I would say as much as as fifteen percent of the sheds that I see have some degree of extra material that got removed during the casting period, mm-hmm. and a chunk of material, if you will. And what we've seen is that that can, not always, but can lead to an antler deformity in future years. If they uh, damage, the, so if they damage that pedicle, then I want to be on, on guard the next season. When I see that buck again in trail camera pictures, I'm going to look at the antler on that same side and say, is that antler normal or not? And if it's abnormal, particularly highly abnormal, I've got a good indication of what caused that. Uh, it's not a genetic abnormality. You know, it can't pass it on to the next generation. It was simply a, an, an antler injury at time of casting, a, a pedicle injury. Um, and so that can give you an idea of whether that buck, you know, and if it happens in, in, in one year, it's likely to happen in, 
you know, pretty much every year thereafter. Yeah. Some degree of abnormality. So I like to kind of, you know, keep that in mind as well. And then I also obviously look at where on the landscape I find it to, because if it's a buck, I want to kill the following hunting season, particularly late in the season, uh, towards the very end of the hunting season, I've got a good indication of where he likes to spend his time. So I can use that to my advantage and, 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 uh, put in a little more effort on that, that part of the property late season. So there's a whole lot of information out there that you can get from these antlers that a lot of hunters, you know, don't, don't perhaps think about initially when they find one. So one of the, one of the questions I have then when you pick this shed up and I, I did a little bit of research, you know, are you able to tell how healthy a deer is based off of that cast antler? So one of the things I saw was that if the base of that antler has essentially a, a round protrusion of the, the base itself, it sounds mm-hmm. like that that's a relatively healthy deer, but mm-hmm. if that base is uh, concaved in, then that, mm-hmm. that says that they're, or what I've read on about was that that deer's got something going on. Is that true or what are your well, thoughts I, on that? Yeah, I think it's, it, it's probably is true. And, and here's kind of what's happening there. So, so the normal casting process takes, takes some time. It doesn't just happen in a day or two. The brain doesn't send the signals to the, to the reproductive organs and say cast tomorrow. It, mm-hmm. it low process. In fact, what, what happens is if, 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 if hunters, can, can think about a set of hollow straws that connect the dead antler, the, 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 the dead antler to the living pedicle. In other words, the connection between the, the deer's head and the antlers is a, is, is a group of small, small straw like structures. Right. And they're called the haversion canals. Not that it matters. Okay. But so, so basically you've got, and, and, and when that antler is solidly attached, those straws are filled with, you might say a marrow like substance, mm-hmm. a solid substance. And slowly what happens is that uh, as testosterone levels decline, it causes this sucking out of that structure inside those, those straws to make the straws very brittle and weak. Okay. And eventually, and eventually they break and the antler comes off. In fact, that's the only known, it's kind of fascinating. There's a lot of interesting stuff about antlers, but that's the only known connection of a dead tissue to a living tissue in the entire mammalian world. There's no other mammal on the planet that has, a connected piece of dead structure, an, an antler is basically dead bone mm-hmm. connected to its living skull. So that's a really unique process. So what happens normally is a slow reduction, a slow sucking out of that material to where the antler comes off and it forms that nice rounded um, base to a shed antler. Okay. What happens in a situation where you get rapidly declining testosterone levels, abnormally fast declines in testosterone. Instead of getting a convex structure, you get a concave structure. So what that tells me is that for some reason, that buck who has a, an abnormally concave, you know, a cupped out base versus a, a rounded base to its shed antler, that that buck's testosterone levels drop very quickly for some reason. Hmm. And that could be stress. And so my, my gut is, and, and, and a good sort of anecdote here is that we had a, a buck at the University of Georgia years ago. It was one of my research deer that I was doing for scent communication at the time. And this buck got so aggressive towards fellow students that we either had to kill him uh, or we had to change his attitude and you can't, and you change their attitude by removing two things that make them a male. If you know what I'm talking about. Yep. Uh, and so his name before the procedure was bud. It became bud light after the procedure. <laughs> uh, I like that. So, so, so we castrated this buck. Yeah. And so if you castrate a buck while it's uh, in hard antler, uh, oh, sorry, if it's, Basically, this buck became a velvet buck, all right, so because he had not enough testosterone to harden the uh, antler and go through the process. So he, he grew a velvet set of antlers and became very placid, obviously, because he wasn't an aggressive buck anymore. We'd mm-hmm. castrated him. So we decided uh, in our infinite wisdom, uh, me and Dr. Carl Miller, that we would give him a shot of testosterone so that he could go through the normal antler hardening velvet remo- removal process yeah. and become a buck for a short period of time. Unfortunately, the literature on how much testosterone one should give a buck was not very good. And so what we did is what most food plotters do is if it says, you know, three pounds per acre of seed, you double it. <laughs> so we uh, we doubled the dose of testosterone and we hit this buck uh, with, with the testosterone. And I can tell you, he went through a very accelerated rutting cycle and very hyper. He was so hyper, we had to put him in a half acre outside pen and he ran laps for about five days and stop and rub and scrape and just do laps. He was, wow. he was, he was jacked up on testosterone, but, but because 
the it was a a uh, his source of testosterone was a shot mm-hmm. in his blood system. It left him pretty quickly. Yeah, for test your testicles that will produce it on a sustained basis. So it went. He went through a highly accelerated rutting process and then a highly accelerated casting process. Okay. And so his antlers were cupped like you can't imagine. You could have drunk, you know, consumed water out of the cups in his antlers because it, the testosterone levels dropped so quickly. Oof. This buck. Uh, so that's that's basically supporting mm-hmm. what we discussed in terms of stress causing that concave versus a, a convex type uh, base to a cast antler. Now, have you seen have you seen any differences or similarities? I guess if the older the deer gets, do you see that concave? starting to happen more or do you see that in younger deer or to be honest i don't know that i've i, I can address that mm-hmm. um you know my, my gut is that an older buck may you know it's really old buck we're talking about ancient you know yeah. well, i'm not Super talking old. about seven eight year olds i'm talking about teenagers yeah uh, my gut is that they they might cast a little more quickly you know in fact some of the bucks we saw there in texas we think mm-hmm. were some of their very oldest bucks and they happen to have bucks on this ranch that can be 10 years of age or older. Yeah. 10 or 12 um, very years. Very rare situation. They have some, some really old bucks. So that would be my inclination, but I honestly don't know. Okay. So going back to, um, when you find antlers or, um, or when you find their sheds, does that mean that's where that buck lives? So let's say, you know, you find it random spot on your property. I know there's some people that, uh, I think a common misconception is that wherever you find that shed, that's where that buck's home base is. That's where that buck is always going to be. How true is that? No, I mean, what we see obviously is is something we call home range shifts. Mm-hmm. And it's certainly most common in, in bucks during the summertime. And this is a misnomer that a lot of hunters have. They're out there glassing soybean fields or food plots in the summer months and watching these bucks, these bachelor groups out there. And they're so excited because they've got six or eight shooter bucks out there, man, this is going to be the best year ever. And then they experience this Houdini act yep. uh, in, in bow season when all of a sudden most of these bucks disappear. Mm-hmm. That's a very normal uh, condition we see with, with many, many radio telemetry studies on, on bucks across the whitetails range. And that's simply they have a summer home range where they'll camp out in a bachelor group and, and feed actively and then some, not all, some of those bucks will then uh, typically in September, October will shift to their fall or breeding home range. Yep. Sometimes that's next door. Sometimes it's on them and sometimes it's a mile or two down the road. So you see this disbanding of these bachelor groups, some bucks staying locally and some, you know, going distant lands. Mm-hmm. And, and so we see that, that shift often, some of them will then shift back to that same summer location the following year. Uh, most once they shift during the fall will stay on that fall area during the breeding season. Uh, some will, will, will stay there through the, the, the early spring months and then return to that summer area. Yeah. So you see a lot of movement. Uh, so where you find a cast antler really only tells you where that buck was at that point in time on your property. Uh, obviously we all hope it's, it's part of their, their, their core home, home range during the hunting season. Mm-hmm. It could not be, it's possible it's not. Uh, but I got one one little anecdote here of a buck that um, I was fortunate enough to hunt, never harvest, a few years ago here in North Georgia on my hunting property. And this buck for four consecutive years never showed up on our property before September 27th in really? a given year, but never later than October 6th. Huh. So between September 27th and October 6th for four consecutive years, he showed up on us. And he would stay on us through at least May. Uh, and then he would probably go back to wherever he came from. Uh, and this happened to be a gross Boone and Crockett deer at his prime. And uh, so obviously each year as he was getting bigger, you know, we were sitting on pins and needles hoping he would come back. You know, you're running trail cameras all July, August, early mm-hmm. September. And where is, where is, you know, where's big boy? And all of a sudden there he was. And once he was there, we'd get his picture every night. Uh, never, never hardly a daytime picture. And therefore we never harvested him. Uh, finally, at uh, eight and a half years of age, the year after he was a gross Boone and Crockett, uh, one of our neighbors shot him. He had regressed down to a mid one forties deer at that point. Wow! But it was, but it was nice that you know at least he was harvested eventually. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we see these range shifts uh, occur a lot, uh, and they're just part of the part of the deer world. Natural movement of deer on the landscape. Man, and it's pretty crazy to think how far travel or how far they travel. I mean, the place that we hunt here in Texas, it, it's low fence. 
and it's it's a small parcel of land and in regard to the state itself you know it's less than 200 acres there's lots of thousand big thousand acre ranches and so i have that june july august bachelor groups will be sticking around all the way through september and then it seems right about that time you know bow season's happening and then right before rifle general rifle starts early november those deer disappear and then it's like a whole new batch of deer just come in Mm -hmm. never seen them before and then they just they come in i don't know don't know those deer at all and and then now all the deer that i had in the fall that survived those bucks are starting to show back up on camera again Mm -hmm. well one thing it's i think important from a hunting perspective is hunters who are running trail cameras and have identified a bachelor group of bucks in their property if they've got more than one year of experience with those they can generally divide them into two different groups Mm -hmm. and i call them you know the, the stayers and the leavers. Yep. Those those who stay, you can pretty well predict are going to, if they stayed last deer season on your property during the hunting season, they're probably going to be there again. Mm-hmm. Those that left you last September, October are likely to leave you again. Yeah. So, so if one of those leavers is a buck of, of, of choice, one you want to harvest, you don't have the luxury of waiting until the rut and, and mm-hmm. fine tuning all your strategies. You've got to hunt them hard and fast. So if you're a bow hunter, if you've identified one of these, these leavers, you got to just roll the dice and get after them. Yeah. And, you know, if you bump them, you bump them, but you know, they're going to leave you anyway, uh, based on their history. So, so I really divide my bucks into those two different groups. And if I've got one that I really want to try to harvest, I'm going to hunt him exclusively right out of the gate. As long as he's around, I'm going to stay on him because I know my days are limited with him versus some of the others. I can be more strategic. I can wait till the right, you know, everything's perfect and hunt them in November during a rut, or I can wait late in the season on, food sources. So it really does help to, to segregate your bucks into those two camps. Uh, and then you got this third camp of those that might just show up on you, you yeah. know, randomly. And those, you just got to kind of take as catch as catch can, if you will. Um, <laughs> Look at the draw on those. Yeah. Now we also have some, some pretty interesting data, both out of Texas and a number of other States. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it shows that the vast majority of bucks will take one or more excursions as they're called Mm -hmm. during the breeding season. And these excursions typically are defined as one mile movements where they'll literally just pack up their bags and go a mile or more, sometimes up to three miles out of their home range, typical home range and stay there for anywhere from 12 hours to 36 hours. Yeah. And then in return, uh, and some will make as many as half a dozen of these excursions throughout the season. Some will take one or two, most will take at least one. And this helps explain where, you know, hunters sometimes, you know, they're running trail cams, they think they got every buck identified, then all of a sudden this giant buck shows up and they either see it or they kill it. They go, and, and then there's no more, you know, if they don't kill it, there's just you know, got a couple of trail cam pictures or one observation and he's mm-hmm. gone again. Like, where did he go? You know, well, he probably was on one of these journeys uh, outside of his normal home range. And if you're lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time, you may literally kill a buck that lives 90% of its life or more, yep. three miles from you. But for that one 24 hour period, you happen to be on the ranch or the property where he came through and you got him. So just count yourself lucky. So a lot of hunters think yeah, this buck still, you know, they get a couple of trail cam pictures of a big buck and they think, man, he's honest. He's, where did he go? Did he get killed? Did he die? Well, he may have just gone back to where he came from. Maybe it's simple as that, you know. Yeah. Uh, and I, I saw that myself this year. I, we were, you know, we had our consistent group amount of deer. And then as soon as the rut hit, um, or rut was getting into the swing of things, I had this giant, giant eight point that had these big muley forks on them that we just called them the the mule buck. Saw them, I had two pictures of them. That was it, never to be seen again. And that yeah. I, that explains yeah. that that he was yeah, just good, there. good chance he lived somewhere else, and you yeah. just got lucky to get the couple of pictures you did. Now you know the good news is, is that if he survives, you know if he survives, what's really interesting out of a Pennsylvania study I saw is that mm-hmm. the bucks that do this often do it almost on the same days each year, which is really? crazy. Yeah. So what I would do if, if, if that buck, you think he might still be alive mm-hmm. is I would look at when you did get the pictures and the trail cams and I would mark out those two or three days and hunt him hard those days. Cause there's a good chance he'll come back through. Go back uh, to the, go back yeah. to the same days. Yeah. And what, what's really interesting is we don't know, you know, why they're going out there. We assume because it's during the breeding season, they're looking for receptive does. Maybe they got one, they're bumping a doe that you know, on the edge of her home range that he's falling into her main home range. We, we assume it's doe related, but there's some of these excursions that occur during the spring in some areas. So yeah, it's probably is, is breeding related, but what we don't know 
And I've always wondered is, is are they returning to their birth area? Uh, because many hunters know of a, of a concept called dispersal. Okay. And dispersal is a process that occurs in bucks between 12 months of age and 18 months of age. So bucks that are one year old or 18 months of old or somewhere in that window will typically pack their bags and leave the areas in which they're born mm -hmm. and travel some distance away to set up a new home range. That is a natural phenomenon in a lot of mammals and it keeps the, the you know, the, 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 uh, the, the related individuals, the bucks and the does from breeding back on themselves long-term. So yeah. it's, it's nature's way of genetic flow. Mm -hmm. So, and, and the research is pretty consistent, somewhere between 50 and 70% of these young bucks leave the area. So all these young button bucks that hunters are working so hard to protect, and they should be, yeah, the, half or more of them will never grow up as adult bucks on their property. They're going to grow up on somebody else's property, unless you have a very large property, obviously. Yeah. But the, the average dispersal distance is between one and three miles. Huh. And so so if, you, if you do that, you're talking about a 3,000 acre parcel plus so you're talking about a pretty good old chunk of land. So most hunters don't hunt that. Mm -hmm. So, so the vast majority of these button heads that they're watching will not be their adult bucks. Now, the good news is, is all the neighbors' button bucks are coming your way. Yeah. Uh, so you're trading these one-year-old, these 12-month or 18-month-old deer, and um, and those that disperse as 18-month-old, you know, first year rack, year and a half old bucks, mm -hmm. most of them do it in October. And that's well, what's happening across America in October. A lot of people hunting. So a lot of times these naive young bucks are literally walking onto a property for the first time and year and a half old bucks aren't hard to kill to start with, but nope. you, know, you, you put them on new ground that they've never been on before. So if you ever kind of watched a, a young buck walk on your property in October and looking around, like they've never been there before. Well, there's a chance they've never been there before. That's true. Uh, they could be in their dispersal movement event at that time. Uh, so some in interesting things going on with deer movements on the landscape there. So, I want to get back to sheds a little bit. Mm -hmm. How a how many times have you seen this, and how likely is it that a buck will drop both of their antlers within sight of each other? I know you talk that a lot of times they'll shed one or cast one, and then within a forty eight hour window they'll cast the other. How 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 likely is it that they'll lose both of them within sight? Well, there's probably some folks out there that, that, that are more avid shed hunters than even I am that could probably address that better, how many match sets they found. I can only speak from my experience, and I've got four sets of match set sheds in, in my career so far. Okay. So not, not that many sets have matched, and, and, and they're not all even whitetail. I've got some match set of axis deer, fallow deer, uh, probably more than four, but not more than probably six or seven mm -hmm. total match sets. And most of those I did find within 50 yards of each other. Um, so again, I don't know if that's any kind of pattern or not. Um, you know, and it could be often that we, you know, just simply don't find the other cast that is nearby. Yeah. Uh, you know, I had a situation this past weekend. Um, my daughter killed a really, really big eight pointer, 155. Yeah, she did. Eight, just a tremendous animal, um, 155 inch eight pointer. And, uh, God. she, uh, she, she made a great shot and got it on camera and he ran 50 yards and piled up out in the brush in, in South Texas. And so we wandered out there to get him and, and just admire him. And I, I, I rolled him over to just admire his antlers. And I noticed an antler underneath his belly. And I'm like, hang on a minute. He didn't shed an antler. I'm looking at both of his antlers. I'm like, that's a cast. And I thought, well, that's pretty random. Um, that it died on top of a cast antler. And so I reached down and picked up the cast and I went, you got to be kidding me. This is that buck's cast antler from the year before. Seriously. No, no question about it. I mean, perfect match, everything, every curl in the brow, 100% that buck's cast antler from the year before. Wow. And, and it just randomly, and it was a, you know, it was a mad, you know, death dash. It was not him out there mm -hmm. seeking a bedding area where he might have cast it. It was just a random run out in the brush, and he fell on top of his antler from the year before. I mean, I've seen some random stuff in my career, wow. but that's as random as I've run across. And I, I only regret that we didn't have time to go back and look other one um it was probably we, somewhere nearby probably wasn't too far away we just didn't have the opportunity to go uh to go look for it but i've found some shed antlers in random ways before but mm -hmm. i've never found one by recovering a deer on top of it um and on its own antler to begin with so that was a pretty that's going to have to be a, a story oh, that, yeah. uh, if anybody believes it i mean thankfully i got at least one witness <laughs> my daughter but uh, but yeah that's a that's pretty random so how big was the place that y'all were hunting on uh, it was 700 acres. 
so so not, not by Texas standards. Do you think that that deer probably spent most of his time on another side of that property and he that happened to just be his range for that specific time of year and that's why y'all found that shed? I, I, I mean, I, I can only speculate. Um, you know, I'm not intimately familiar with the ranch. It's my second year to hunt it. Uh, the landowner runs a lot of trail cams. And, and what he does see, though, is even as relatively small of a ranch that is by Texas standards, yeah. uh, the, the deer do seem to frequent certain areas of the property more than others. So they do have, you know, defined areas of use. So my gut is that was part of his core, core area uh, on the ranch. And that's why he cast his antlers there, you know, at, at least one antler there. Um, so that's, that's speculation, but uh, probably true. Now, have you ever shot a deer? on an MLD property like that in Texas, you know, late where you've shot them and their antlers just fall off right when, right no, when they I've hit. Been, I've been extremely fortunate that has never occurred and it ha happened to me, but I can tell you after we observed several bucks with cast antlers on this mm -hmm. particular hunt, that moving both that, that eight pointer she killed and she absolutely outdid herself, went back and shot one almost as big the next day. I mean, I, I mean, she got shot two, that one was 150 inch eight and this was, a, the other one was 155. So she got 300 plus inches of eight point antler in two hunts. She um, So she killed two deer, like killing an eight point at 150 inches. That's like something that guys like yeah. you and me, like that, that's a life goal to kill. I've never, I've never shot one that big. I mean, she's outdone me twice now. I mean, I've never killed a, <laughs> what I consider a big eight and, she did it on, on basically back to back days. And what was interesting about that, that first buck is, mm -hmm. you know, we brought it back to camp. The landowner was excited and she was over the moon and we said, Hey, we know that deer because he'd given us a bunch of trail cam picks. And so we started looking through those trail cam picks. We said, yep, that's him. And we started looking at it going, I don't think that is him. This deer, even though it's a, it was basically a big mainframe eight with a small G4 on yeah. its left side. So it's technically a nine pointer, but if you, you know, it's an eight in my, in my brain. Right. Um, and, 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 and this deer we're looking at in the trail cam photos look almost identical, same little G4, but it's brow times were a little different. It didn't have a kicker off the base. <clears throat> it was wider, you know, one G2 wasn't as long. We said, that's, that's a different deer, even though it looks like a twin, it's, it's a different deer. Mm -hmm. The landowner was like, well, I don't know the buck you just shot then because we don't have any pictures of him. Uh, and so it's kind of like a freebie, you know, Hey, we yeah. just shot it. But you didn't even know you had. And so, <laughs> and so she, uh, she goes out the next day and she wanted to kill, try to get a deer with her bow. She, she just started, she's 21, just started bow hunting this fall and said, all right, we've got a tripod stand for you. We'll go sit you on. And mm -hmm. we set her on a tripod and, and she gets up there and she can't draw her bow in that tripod. So uh. she's all frustrated. She's running late. She's panicking. And so she's like, well, I'll just grab my gun and go down to that stand where I killed that other eight pointer, maybe a doe or, or low end management buck will come out. You know, she, she wasn't that fussed. So she grabs her rifle, comes in late to the stand. I mean, the whole story, you know, and then this other giant buck comes out, the twin of it, she shoots it. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's and the best I could do the entire hunt was a uh, six and a half year old five point. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that that uh, scored about 60 inches, which was perfect deer to take. I mean, we're yeah. there, we're, we're there as much to, to help the landowner with some of his management bucks. It's a rare situation that, that almost only exists in Texas, but yep. thankfully it does where they can have too many mature bucks. <laughs> uh, they, they need some bucks removed and we were mm -hmm. shooting a few of those too. So we were trying to shoot off the low end and thankfully the landowner was gracious enough, particularly for my daughter to let him, let her, take a couple of uh, his nicer bucks um, and she just happened to be in the right place and, and uh, was super fortunate. So I've got one very, very happy spoiled 21 year old girl who's, who's as geeked out about hunting as any hunter I've ever met. So, so, you know, she is eat up flat, eat up with it and has been since she was four years old. So there you go. Uh, very, very happy dad. Well, I've got a about to be a 16 month old that I'm hoping that she's going to be the same. I've already got her. Anytime she sees an elk come on the TV or she sees a set of elk antlers, she'll do a bugle. So, <laughs> so far I've got her trained right. Well, they don't have to be boys. And, uh, you know, like I said, I've, I'm blessed with two girls, mm -hmm. both both of whom hunt. Um, my, my oldest I've mentioned, she's my super avid, go all the time everywhere, turkey hunting. In fact, she, she and I are going to South Dakota here in a couple of months to get our Merriams to Sweet. finish our, our slams together. So she's got uh, three of the four for a turkey slam already. And then I've got my youngest, who's my super occasional hunter, but the super lucky one. Yep. And she'll go out one time a year and shoot, you know, shoot 140 inch deer in Georgia. I mean, outdo me and her sister for putting in 30 days each and she'll go out <laughs> one day. And she did that on two consecutive years in a single hunt, shot 140 inch plus deer in Georgia. And just like, I don't know what y'all 
put all this time and effort into this. There's nothing to this. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. How, my wife's the same and, way. You know, um, and so so it it, uh, it 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 drives her older sister crazy because you know one of them puts in you know literally five percent the effort that the other one does, and yet has been as successful to this date until recently. Now that my daughter, my older daughter's got these couple of nice big eights. I think she's going to be hard to catch now, but uh, uh, anyway, it's fun having two girls uh, there share the outdoors with. It's been oh a, yeah. Been a real- That's awesome, man. Well, I want to, I kind of want to backtrack a little bit. You were talking about um, that landowner that y'all went to. He hadn't seen that deer before. Mm-hmm. And um, I actually ran into a similar situation this past year on a piece of property outside of Hondo, Texas. It was 1500 acres and they've got trail cameras galore out there. And the guys we were guiding, it was, you know, we knew exactly what kind of age, age range we were wanting to get and as well as antler class. So we knew what we were in. Well, I had this deer come in that I knew that deer was at least six, seven years old, but the antlers on it, he had junk going everywhere and 18, 19 points. And this has been a native herd. It, It is a high fence ranch for those that are listening, you know, but it's just been protein fed, you know supplemental feed program really great management and i messaged the the ranch manager i said hey uh i don't know if this is a shooter or not and then send him the picture and he tells me he goes i've never seen that deer before I'm like mm-hmm. you mean to tell me y'all have got 50 60 70 trail cameras out here and you've never seen this deer and it wasn't that big of a ranch so mm-hmm. how does a deer like that get by without being caught well, I think the combination of either luck or just sheer aversion to feeders or camera sites. Uh, certainly there are, you know, I, I can, I, I've had dozens of, of landowners I've worked with over the years on small, low fenced, unfenced properties, or even high fence properties that yeah. literally don't have pictures of some of their deer. And you think there's no way in a small high fence, yeah. that you couldn't get all your deer on camera. There's no way that's not the case. Um, you know, I've got, uh, one, one friend who's got an 800 acre high fence and, uh, you know, there's, there's bucks in, in that enclosure that he's never gotten a picture of ever, mm-hmm. um, that, that a hunter will see, or he'll see visually while hunting. And he's like, there's, you know, how do I not have him? So, you know, certainly we know from trail camera research, it, you know, they perfected this survey technology of using cameras to survey properly survey your deer herd to, to, uh, to calculate density and fawn recruitment and number of things. And they've shown over and over that some deer have an aversion to feeders, period. They don't care how long you leave them on a property. They're not going to do it. Um, you know, obviously the longer the duration, the longer history of, of feeding or baiting on a ranch or a property, the more likely you are to get a higher percentage of them. Yeah. But even on some of the most intensively fed high fence places that I've, I've been on over my career, there's a certain percentage of deer that you just are not going to get on camera. Uh, for whatever reasons, they either avoid cameras. I mean, we had some research done years ago that looked at aversion to hunting stands, permanent hunting stands. Mm-hmm. This research was done in Maryland, very good study. And it had a number of adult bucks radio collared and a portion of those bucks, not all of them, but a portion of them never once were, were tracked within a hundred yards of one of those permanent hunting locations during daylight hours. Wow. Entire hunting season. They were never once in front of a potential hunter. Huh. Or- those permanent stands. However, at night, many of those bucks use those permanent stands like mile markers on highway. They would walk right under them. I mean, they clearly, clearly knew that danger was, was potentially present in those stands and they were simply going to avoid them during daylight hours. And they did the entire hunting season, more than one buck. Again, not all bucks. Yeah. Some of them are going to die and do stupid things, but there's certainly a percentage of bucks that avoid, you know, and that's why, you know, using, you know, try not to overhunt permanent stands. If you have the ability to, to move, to try new stand locations, climbing stands, ground blinds. I mean, keep keep the deer off on their toes and off their game because there is a certain percentage of them that just simply won't make themselves susceptible mm-hmm. to the light hours unless during the rut when they just simply get so love struck they just make a mistake. Yeah. But outside of that little outside of that window called, we call the rut, some of these bucks are almost unkillable by traditional hunting method. Mm-hmm. Man, I love it. These these animals are smart. They can be hard to kill, and there's a lot that you can tell from their cast antlers. So, man, I know we're going to have to get you on here again. Of course, there's a plethora of information out there when it comes to whitetail, so I know there's definitely going to be – you're going to be on here plenty more, so don't worry. So, Brian, <laughs> just want to thank you for hopping on the podcast today, talking deer, 
talking cast antlers, finding sheds. Just appreciate you taking the time, man. Always a pleasure. Anytime. And there you have it, everybody. Another end to another great episode. We just want to thank Brian for hopping on the podcast with us and talking deer hunting. You know, we, we could talk deer hunting for hours, but we just really appreciate him hopping on and just kind of letting us pick his brain for a little bit. So, again, y'all, we can't thank y'all enough for listening to the podcast. If you haven't yet, make sure you head on over to the Apple Store, Google Play Store, and download the Hunt Stand app. Check us out on Instagram, Facebook. Give us a follow. Head on over to YouTube. Subscribe to the YouTube channel. And if you want to see some more content from us, make sure you go on over to HuntStand.com. Check out our field notes section, everything we got on going over there. But again, thanks for tuning in to the Hunt Stand podcast, and we'll see you on the next one.